welcome to the midterm review of 1413. So now, as I mentioned before, there will be three time types of questions in the exam. Uh, there will be true, false, and certain questions. These are questions where you've given uh, a statement and you're going to ascertain whether the statement is true, false, or uncertain. True means essentially it's strictly true and it's always true, false and it's strictly false, and uh, uh, there's a counterexample to make sure it's false. And uncertain means like um, without having uh, further information, uh, uh, you cannot actually answer the question necessarily, or you cannot really uh, make a statement whether the statement is true or false. Um, in any of you, what you do, please always um, explain your answers carefully. So just writing true, false, or uncertain will almost surely or will surely not give you full credit. You have to explain your answers. It doesn't actually matter that much whether you uh, you get it right if the statement is true or false or uncertain, as long as your answer is actually um, not reasonable and sort of shows some understanding of the material. And you know, you know so so and the quality of the answer is, is quite important. Uh, we also want you to provide intuition, so we do not want you to just write some math um, and, and nothing else. You can use some math to sort of um, clarify your answer or the like, but you always need to provide a verbal uh, explanation and some intuition and some explanation of why you think um, uh, the answer might be, your statement might be true, false, or, 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 or uncertain. For multiple choice questions, Essentially, you're giving uh, different choices, and you just pick one answer and no further explanation. Needed. Very simple. And then there will be sort of PSET style questions that are sort of you're familiar with, either from like PSETs or like previous um, exams. Uh, these will be quite similar to the PSET questions. They will be sort of generally um, not on the hardest side, just so that we don't have so much time to do this. There will be some algebra involved. Again, please always explain your um, answers um, carefully. Now, what materials are you responsible for? Uh, you're responsible for the lectures up to and including lecture 12, which is the lecture on March 11, uh, up to uh, slide 67 of lectures 11 or lecture, uh, the, the notes for a lecture, the handout of the notes for um, lectures 11 to 13. You're also responsible for recitations one through five, recitations uh, six, uh, uh, which is the recitation that Will gave um, which is quite similar to this one, and uh, uh, seven, this recitation that we just reviews that might be helpful um, um, for some of you, but there's no, no new material that you can study uh, right now. PSETs one to three um, um, are, are, are sort of part of the deal. And uh, readings, um, start and non-start readings, side in and class are um, only relevant to the extent that they appear in lectures and or recitation. That's to say, like if I discuss a certain paper and the content of that paper, content of the paper that's discussed in the class um, uh, is relevant to you. However, um, uh, anything that's in the paper that doesn't appear um, in the lecture is not relevant. As in, like you're not going to ask you questions that sort of ask about some obscure details in the papers that you never heard about in class. Uh, how do you get ready for the exam? Well, um, uh, uh, you study study the, the lecture and presentation slides carefully. Um, you should um, uh, uh, make sure you're familiar and comfortable with the PSETs um, and, and the solutions. Make sure you understand and are able to solve the PSETs uh, on your own. A great resource to practice is previous PSETs and exams. Um, again, uh, readings uh, starred and uh, non starred are not required, but they may sort of help you deepen your understanding of the material. Maybe sometimes the lecture notes are a little bit um, dense and don't have that much detail. So you can sort of like try to consult them and try to understand the material as best or better, but we won't ask you about the details of those readings um, uh, 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 beyond what was, um, beyond those details of what was um, covered in class. So let me now sort of like review the material overall and sort of give you a sense of what are the kinds of things that we want you to know. To be clear, this is not exhaustive in the sense of like there are some other materials uh, in the lecture slides that I'm not mentioning here. What I'm trying to do here is just give you a sense of a lot of what the most important key things that you um, should know. Those will cover perhaps like 80, 90 percent of the material that's actually potentially in the exam. Having said that, you know you should. Uh, 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 surely go through the entire lecture slides and make sure you sort of gather um, everything and understand what's going on there. Okay, so the first um, thing we discussed um, uh, is time preferences, in particular the exponential discounting model. Here you should know what is the exponential discounting model. 
what is delta, the time preference parameter in that model? What does it measure? How can we estimate it assuming that an exponential discovery model um, is correct? Further, what are the main assumptions of the uh, exponential discovery model? Um, and what evidence do we have against those assumptions? So in lectures three and four, I discuss those um, uh, uh, assumptions and the evidence against those assumptions in detail. And after that, we discuss the uh, quasi-hyperbolic discounting model, which is a relatively small uh, modification of the exponential discounting model. Again, you should know what is this model, how it's different from the uh, exponential discounting model, and of course the difference is that there's a present bias parameter of beta um, uh, that is added um, to, to, um, to this model, which measures um, uh, short-run discounting as a like how much weight you put on the present versus everything else that's in the future. Now, what empirical evidence um, uh, can the quasi-exponential, uh, quasi-hyperbolic uh, model explain better than the exponential discount model, and why is that? So you should be familiar with, for example, things like preference reversal to demand for commitment. Why is that consistent with the quasi-hyperbolic model? And, 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 and you know, why is it not consistent with the exponential model? Of course, that's what we discussed in the previous slide. These are some of the assumptions of the exponential discount model, where, for example, uh, one of the key assumptions are that there are no preference um, reversals, and we discuss that in detail. Then, um, um, of course, you need to know um, in the quasi hyperbolic uh, discounting model what is the sophistication, what is naivete, and, and what is partial naivete. So, what does beta measure? Um, what does beta hat measure? What is full sophistication, full naivete, and partial naivete? And, uh, and so, questions such as, like, does sophistication make people? Was better off, and um, why or why not? If that's the case. Uh, further, you should understand uh, what is demand for commitment, uh, who demands commitment, and who doesn't. So, like, are fully sophisticated or fully naive people, or partial naive, naive people, um, uh, potentially demanding commitment? What are the conditions under which somebody command, um, uh, demands commitment, um, and what kinds of people? Um, uh, do not do, uh, do demand commitment and what kind of people benefit from uh, doing so. And in particular, uh, can people be worse off from being offered a commitment device and, and, and why is that or, or why not? Uh, next, we discuss in quite a bit of detail empirical applications from a range of different settings. Um, this is a, a, a lectures five and six. So we want you to, do, to be familiar with those empirical um, applications. Um, you should understand whether quasi-hyperbolic model can explain or cannot explain um, uh, uh, some of the empirical evidence uh, better than the exponential discounting model. Um, um, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of like why, why do we think the quasi-hyperbolic model is, is a good fit for some of the empirical examples that I have um, shown. Um, then you need to be able to um, solve problems. Uh, this is a similar problem to the problems in the problem sets that you've seen before. Problem sets where people are either like exponential discounters or like for beta um, uh, delta equals um, or beta equals um, one and delta being like either one or 0.95 or close to one. Quasi hyperbolic discounters, um, and again, like for the naive, for the sophisticated, partially naive agents. How does one solve such problems? Of course, we have plenty of practice already in the P set and midterm um, uh, examples, also in some finals. Uh, so you should sort of um, you should use. Um, uh, backwards or forwards um, uh, uh, induction or iteration, uh, uh, depending on the case. I sort of discussed this in slide 62 um, of lectures three and four and slide 37 of lectures five and six. Uh, there's also a recitation that covers that in detail, so you should have plenty of practice of, of, of doing so. Now, um, let me now give you sort of some examples of like what are some examples of true false on certain questions and uh, how should you answer them. So let me sort of just read the statements for you and you can think about this for a second and then I'm gonna give you um, the answer. So um, consider individuals with beta delta preferences, this is called the hyperbolic uh, discounters, um, who only differ, differ by their present bias, um, have like beta equals uh, uh, between zero and one. And suppose there's a commitment savings device available, the willingness to pay for this commitment device strictly decreases in beta. Now, is that um, uh, uh, true or false statements? The answer is this um, statement is false. 
Now, why is that? Well, there's, um, uh, again, like you could just correct false. That's not going to give you full, uh, full credit, even if the, um, the in fact, the statement is false. What you need to do is you need to sort of provide some further explanation. Um, um, uh, ideally, we you know, provide us like a somewhat detailed explanation. So ideally, um, uh, it, it's false. Uh, if you provide sort of several examples, that's should be better um, than just one. Uh, in this case, um, why is it false? Well, A, individuals might be naive, right? So if, in particular, if people are fully naive, they will not be willing to pay for any anything for equipment devices. So um, regardless of the beta, um, willingness to pay will always be zero, so I will surely not decrease in beta. Second, the commitment device may just not be effective at all. If the commitment device is useful, useless, it doesn't matter what beta is, nobody will demand commitment um, anyway. And finally, even if individuals, this is a little bit more uh, trickier explanation, and I wouldn't necessarily expect you to, to um, know that answer, but even if individuals are fully sophisticated and the device is effective, the commitment device is effective, willingness to pay may not be uh, strictly decreasing uh, in beta. And here's sort of an example. Well, if beta equals zero or beta equals one, then individuals would be willing to pay zero for the commitment device, right? Because you know, if beta equals zero, they don't care about the future. If beta equals one, they just don't need any equipment devices. Um, but in between, the, the uh, willingness to pay might be positive um, for beta to be between zero and one. So that essentially means that um, uh, willingness to pay would be sort of an inverse U in beta. Again, that's a bit of a tricky answer, like the, the third bullet point, you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect you um, to, to know that answer, but you should be able to, to, to say uh, or to answer um, uh, a reason one or reason two in a specific case. Um, second example uh, statement, fully sophisticated individuals can experience large welfare losses um, from their present bias. The answer is this is true, why is that? Let me think about this for a second. Well, the answer is that awareness of present bias, that is like sophistication, does not remove present bias. Even if people are sophisticated, um, uh, uh, you know, the present bias is still there. There might be some commitment devices, some ways in which people are able to overcome their uh, uh, sort of the, the, the losses associated with present bias. But in the absence of commitment devices, uh, uh, people may still make suboptimal decisions. And some of these decisions uh, might, in fact, induce large welfare needs. We discussed some examples in class, uh, so numerical examples, where you could see that sophisticated people might actually be worse off than naive people and could, in fact, um, uh, suffer quite a bit from or some relatively large welfare losses from their present bias. All of this is evaluated by their long running utility, as in, like, if somebody makes uh, uh, choices for the future um, uh, um, where the beta is sort of not relevant, uh, compared to sort of that kind of welfare criterion, uh, people might be a lot worse off due to their welfare, uh, due to their present bias. Okay, here's example number three. Present bias individuals always have positive demand for commitment devices. Um, again, the um, uh, statement is false. Uh, why is that? And you kind of discussed this already in the previous um, questions. And let me still be very explicit. There's sort of three conditions that must be met for positive demand for commitment. I discussed this in class. Uh, the person must be present bias or have some forceful awareness of self-control problems. Individuals must, the person must be aware of their present bias, so they can't be fully naive. They could be partially naive, but they can't be fully naive. And the individual must perceive the commitment device as effective in helping uh, overcome the self-control problem. That's to say, if somebody is offered a commitment device and that commitment device is useless, well, there's going to not going to be any uh, demand for commitment, particularly if the person perceives that the commitment device is, is uh, uh, useless. Notice that that person might actually perceive the commitment device to be effective when well, reality is not. So they might have some positive demand for commitment, even if the commitment device is in reality useless because their beliefs are wrong because of essentially um, some form of partial naivete. Um, um, but it cannot be that the person perceives the commitment device as not effective because then the person would just not demand it in the first place. Now this might, that makes the, now the statement false when only the first condition of the three is met, as in like the person's only present bias, uh, then we cannot be sure um, that there will be positive 
and demand for um, commitment. Right, and so the statement, um, uh, as it is said, is false because um, we said sort of like always have positive demand for commitment. If it were without the always, then you know you could also answer like uncertain because then you would say well it depends on the naivete or on uh, uh, the sophistication or it depends on how effective the commitment device is. But the way the statement is written, it says like always, and so now you can easily come up with some counterexamples um, that show that the statement in fact is false. Okay. The second topic um, that we discussed after um, time preferences was risk preferences, in particular expected utility. So here, you know, um, you need to have a, a clear understanding of what is the expected utility model, what is risk aversion, why are people risk averse, um, how is risk aversion specifically modeled in the expected utility model, uh, what is the expected monetary value, um, uh, um, and also things like what is concavity and um, um, what does concavity have to do? What is the expected utility versus the expected monetary value? And what does the concavity imply for risk aversion um, um, uh, in the expected utility model? Um, then next, how can we measure risk aversion within the expected utility model? In particular, we discussed uh, three types of ways of measuring risk aversion. We discussed certainty equivalents, we discussed choices from gambles, we also discussed um, insurance choices. Uh, this is a Sidner paper. And then we discussed what is problematic about the estimates of risk aversion in the expected utility model. Um, in particular, we discussed evidence that found that there tends to be substantial small scale risk aversion. So when you give people small gambles, they tend to be quite risk averse, or they tend to be um, uh, have a very quite high gamma. But you know, we know also from large scale choices that their risk aversion uh, tend, cannot be actually that high or when people make these choices. People leave the house every day and engage in quite a few um, um, risks uh, in the long run. They hold stocks and so on. So that must mean that their um, uh, long run, when using sort of long run choices, uh, that implies essentially a relatively low gamma. Now, since the expected utility model only has like one parameter, it cannot explain both of those features and sort of it, it always has um, um, trouble. So essentially, what you, if you try to match uh, a small scale risk aversion, then you need to have a very large gamma, high gamma. And if you try to match large scale risk aversion, you need to have a low gamma. And that sort of brings uh, uh, trouble because you can't just explain both of those things. And sort of Matthew Rabin and Rabin and Thaler, uh, as well as recitation four, um, discuss um, this conundrum and this issue in, in quite a bit of detail. Next, we discuss Kahneman and Tversky's uh, 1979 prospect theory. This is a seminal paper, uh, and uh, if you should if you remember uh, just a few papers from this class, this is one of the papers that you should really um, know about. And so what evidence in Kahneman and Tversky is inconsistent with respect to utility? Well, in particular, so there are several things in there, but we discussed mostly one feature, which is risk aversion in the game domain and risk lovingness um, uh, uh, in, the, in the loss domain. And so, now, one of the most important points from Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory is sort of the proposed alternative to expected utility system, slide uh, three or 51 of, of um, uh, lecture nine. Well, there's sort of three features discussed there. One is like changes rather than levels or the arguments of the utility function. Then there's loss aversion. Um, so there's a kink uh, of the utility function around the reference point. And um, there's dim diminishing uh, sensitivity meaning there's um, a, the utility function is concave in the um, game domain when you're sort of uh, above the reference point and is convex in the last domain when you're below the reference point. Okay, so now um, what does sort of this proposed uh, alternative to utility or value function look like? How does it incorporate the three features? Again, we sort of discussed this um, um, and it's utility function in lecture uh, nine that sort of um, uh, talks about this in detail or the lecture talks about this utility function in detail. One key question here then is like, how is the reference point determined? What are some candidate reference points? So one candidate would be the status quo, another reference point uh, candidate would be expectation, but there could be also other things such as goal and aspirations. Uh, recitation five discusses this a little bit, um, uh, not in too much uh, detail. Now, then um, uh, we discuss empirical evidence, in particular, what empirical evidence of loss aversion do we have? We talked about small-scale gambles, we talked about the endowment, in fact, in particular, 
and then we discuss some uh, applications um, uh, uh, in lecture nine. So what are these applications? We discuss labor supply, the housing market, stocks, marathon running, and golf. So you should be um, uh, uh, familiar with these empirical applications from lecture nine. You should in particular understand why reference-dependent preferences can explain some of the empirical evidence um, uh, that showed better than the expected utility models. You should understand, you know, is some of the evidence that we see consistent with the expected utility model, and why, if not, why not? And why is the reference-dependent model, or in particular, which feature of the reference-dependent model can explain false? What are the features, again, uh, changes rather than levels, um, uh, sort of some reference point, reference dependence, the loss aversion and diminishing rate sensitivity, um, and so which feature is actually important in explaining things, we focus mostly on loss aversion. What is not relevant is uh, the deal or no deal evidence and the paper by Pearson. Now, there's a couple of slides at the end of lecture nine that I didn't really cover or didn't cover at all. So you, we're not going to ask any questions um, about that. Um, so now, how do you solve problems with reference dependent preferences? You can sort of see problem set um, three, uh, question number one, had some questions about this. And again, there's additional piece and exam questions uh, that you can practice with. So there are quite a few of those kinds of questions. Now, um, here's sort of some, uh, an example of a multiple choice question. Here's, uh, uh, so Maddie wrote this question. So Maddie, in fact, appears. Uh, the question is, um, Maddie is writing uh, a problem set for 14.13. She gets utility U of Q from the number of questions she writes. She has reference dependent preferences around the goal of writing 10 uh, questions. The 10 is a reference point. Reference point. If you normalize the utility of 10 questions to zero, which of the following uh, would be consistent with loss aversion? I'll let you have a look at this. So there's option A, U of 8 equals minus 2, U of 12 equals 1. U of 8 and number B, option B, U of 8 equals minus 2, U of 12 equals 2. And then number C is, option C is U of 8 equals minus 1 and U of 12 equals 2. Um, and so which of those um, um, uh, answers is consistent with loss aversion? The answer is option A. Um, now why is that? Well, loss of aversion sort of implies that losses hurt more than gains help. So with preferences as an A, Maddie would have a utility um, cost of two from falling short of her goal of two questions, but only a gain of one util um, from exceeding her goal by two questions, right? So the goal, the, the, the gain of um, uh, 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 exceeding of being uh, by two questions above, um, uh, so being two questions above gives her some gain of one util, but the utility cost of falling short is two is twice as large, which just tends to be kind of like the evidence that we see in loss aversion. And the other two um, uh, examples don't have that feature, so really only um, uh, answer number A is, is, is correct. Um, second question, Maddie is walking home and passes a bakery. Unexpectedly, she decides to buy a pastry. For example, she looks at the pastry and it looks really nice. Prior to purchasing the pastry, her maximum willingness to pay for the pastry was P0. Then she runs into Alan, this is our previous excellent TA, who asks to buy the pastry from her. She offers him the lowest price she's willing to accept, P1. Which of the following comparisons between P0 and P1 is consistent with an endowment effect? P0 larger than P1, P0 equals P1, or P0 smaller than P1? The answer is um, answer number C. Why is that? Well, the endowment effect says that people are, um, when their willingness to, to um, pay, this is in this case P0, is smaller than their willingness to accept um, when they're selling something. That is to say, being endowed with an item, in this case like a, a, a pastry, increases one's willingness to pay. That is to say, um, if somebody asks you to sell something that you own, um, you ask for more money than uh, you're willing to pay in the first place when you don't own the item. And so uh, uh, the endowment effect will then predict that, or the endowment effect uh, entails that now P1 equals uh, is larger than uh, P0, um, which is answer number C. So Maddie values the pastry more after she has bought it um, uh, compared to like prior to buying. 
Okay. The third broad um, set of preferences that we discussed were social preferences. We didn't quite finish with this, so we're not going to cover everything, um, in particular not lecture 13, um, and uh, the estimation part of like social preferences, which will be in part from, uh, from choices, which will be uh, in preset 4. You should understand what social preferences are. You should also understand how can you measure um, social preference, preferences in lab games. We discussed at length the dictator game, the ultimatum game, and the trust game. Um, you should also be broadly familiar, not in detail, uh, but broadly familiar of what evidence do we typically find in dictator and ultimatum games. Um, for, in, for instance, in dictator games, people tend to give something like 20 to 30 percent of their, their share. Um, so to, people tend to be quite nice in those games. Now, then uh, we discussed then, like, given that evidence, so given that people look quite nice in these types of games, People also, um, there's also some other evidence people give and share to charity or things like that. Um, now, do we think that is evidence of people being generally nice to others because of poor altruism? Uh, or um, if not, um, why not? We discussed sort of three sets of evidence in particular. We discussed uh, uh, the costly exit or exit options in dictator games where people essentially, when they're able to leave the dictator game, they rather sort of leave um, and give uh, and sort of keep the money or they even willing, willing to pay some small amount of money to leave the dictator game and not having to, to, to face some other person, but they then feel, feel compelled to give to others. There was the option of hiding behind a computer. So if a computer, uh, if you are, if a computer gives you the option to hide behind the computer and to be mean to others, you might um, take advantage of that and actually be meaner than you would be otherwise. So like altruism or people's giving tends to go down quite a bit when they're able to hide behind the computer. And then there's, uh, so both of those types of pieces of evidence are evidence of social image being important in giving. People care a lot about what others uh, uh, think, in particular what others think about them, and they want, don't want to upset others. And um, so if they are able to avoid those kinds of situations, um, they might be able to, they might want to do that, which would suggest that it's not really that they want others to do well in the sense of that they really want others to have money or have more money um, uh, than before, but rather it's because of social pressure or social image concerns people might um, give in dictator or ultimatum games. Um, moreover, there's some evidence of like self-image about people caring about their uh, uh, what they think about themselves. They want to think of themselves as being a good person, uh, and so the evidence of the moral um, wiggle room seems to, to suggest that um, these concerns are quite important. In particular, people are engaging in some behavior um, where they um, uh, sort of delude themselves that they are in fact are nice, when in reality um, uh, they're not. And so that's discussed in detail um, in the lecture. Uh, again, we will not ask you to should be kind of familiar with this type of evidence, um, and you should be familiar why that sort of tells us that people are perhaps not as nice as you might have thought. Uh, they are just coming from like dictator ultimatum games or from like um, donations. We will not ask you about models that estimate social preferences. That will be in problem set four, so don't worry about um, that. So the, the stuff on like Charnas and Raven, that's there. Um, we will not ask you about that. Okay. So then um, here's a, a, another example of a true false uncertain question. Statement if a person gives a zero in a dictator game, this is evidence that this person is selfish. Um, now, uh, the answer is false. I think if you answer it uncertain, that would also be fine. Uh, why is that? Well, the person might give a zero uh, to the other person in the dictator game and then uh, donate the money to someone in greater need, right? And then that person is, in fact, really quite nice. Um, uh, second, the person might be very poor relative to the other person in the game, so her marginal utility is just very high. So now, even if you have like you know equal weights to like your own utility and the other person's utility, um, uh, since the marginal utility of giving ten dollars to yourself compared to the other person is way higher than uh, the other person's marginal utility, you might just give everybody everything to yourself. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't care about others. It just means like, in fact, even if you were um, uh, sort of like a social planner, um, you would give it to that person because that person is like in huge need, while the rich person just might not really need that money. Um, looking at this more closely, actually, I think uncertain would be a, a better answer here and not false. I just wrote this question fairly quickly. So if the question says, 
Um, if the question instead were to say, this is conclusive evidence that this person is selfish, um, then you know um, it would be false, or this would be, this is clearly evidence, or this person must be selfish, um, uh, you know, that would be false. The way it's written right now, it's rather sort of uncertain because we just don't quite know. It could be that the person is really selfish, um, uh, uh, or you know, it could be that the person, um, it could be that this evidence that the person is selfish, but it could be the other two reasons that I just um, mentioned. Uh, okay, so now um, finally I'm going to give you a, a long question or an example of a long question, um, uh, and this is the question of laptop policies. We talked about this a little bit earlier in, in, uh, in, in class, in fact, in the first lecture, and we had the first problem set about this, and this is sort of like an algebraic version of, of that kind of question. So assume uh, the 14, 13 students are present biased with uh, beta smaller than one and delta equals zero. All students have the same beta smaller than one and delta equals zero, but they differ in uh, uh, the value they derive from using laptops in class L. L is constant for each student from class to class, but uniformly distributed across students uh, uh, on the interval between zero and one. Okay, so there's you know, uh, some people have like a huge value of using the laptop in class and, and others um, uh, do not. Each lecture generates no immediate utility, so it's neither fun nor like annoying with like, but it does give a benefit, uh, a future benefit of V. Okay, so like you might learn something or some, some things that might be uh, valuable to you in the future. Using a laptop reduces the long-run benefit by D. Uh, this might be, you know, like uh, distractions in particular, so you might be um, uh, distracted during class when you use a laptop, so the, the, the future benefits are, are diminished by that. Maybe you said something really insightful, you can pay attention, um, and so now um, uh, uh, the benefit is B minus um, uh, D if you use a laptop. Both V and D are the same for all students. So there's no variation, variation about, uh, um, uh, across students there. The only variation is coming from like some students who really, really like using laptops for various reasons, perhaps because you know they like to surf on the internet. Um, um, uh, perhaps they're really in need um, uh, of using laptops because that, that allows them to take proper notes. So in summary, a student uh, uses a laptop in class, uh, that, sorry, a, a student that uses the laptop in class gets immediate utility L and future undiscounted utility of V minus D. And a student who does not use a laptop gets immediate utility of zero and future discounted utility of V. So, um, uh, and now the social planner is not present bias and seeks to maximize the utility of 14, 13 students from his perspective, okay? Uh, first question, show that students are just indifferent between uh, using and not uh, not using their laptop in the current class if L equals beta uh, times D. Explain why students with lower values of L, so that's like L being lower than beta D, don't use laptops in class, while students with higher values of L, so L exceeds beta D, do use laptops in class. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write down the utilities from the two choices uh, that's essentially already given in the, in, 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 the, in the explanation, except for that we need to be careful where, where the, the beta comes in, right? So if students use a laptop in class, uh, they get the immediate benefit of L, and then in the future, they get what's discounted by beta, which is beta times B minus D, right? Because both B and D are very far in the future. These are the benefits or the diminished benefits B minus D uh, that they get in the future, L is in the present, so there's no beta here. Instead, if somebody uses no laptop, the students get zero, so there's no laptop benefits uh, in the present, and the uh, benefits in the future are, uh, the value of the lecture in the future is undiminished, which means essentially it's just V, so uh, the, the person just gets zero plus beta times V. Now, students, who are indifferent, um, by definition, um, uh, have the same utility of using laptops and using no laptop. So we can essentially just equate those two things. Uh, um, it's, you know, notice that like the beta times V is always there. So it sort of essentially just cancels. And then what we get is 
um, the person that's indifferent for that person, L equals beta times D. Now, students that choose not to use laptops will have low valuations, L of using the laptops, while students that choose to use the laptops will high, have high L, right? If the L is really, if, if, if L is very large, then it exceeds beta times D. If L is very small, then L um, does not exceed, uh, is smaller than beta times D. So given sort of the indifference condition, um, we have essentially, um, uh, as I just said, students that do not use the laptop, L is smaller than beta times D, and students that use the laptop, for them, L is larger than beta times D. Okay. Okay, now uh, question number two. Now consider the policy that allows students to use laptops only if they uh, sign up in advance to sit in a laptop section. It's a little bit different than we had in class, but it's a version or something that I also considered, in fact, in previous years that that was what was used. Now, the question here is, why is L larger or equal than D, not L is larger or equal than beta D, the threshold for opting into the laptop section? Okay, so now this is a choice where people choose not for the present, whether when they come to class, whether they want to use a laptop right now, but instead, they sign up in advance to sit in a laptop section for the rest of the semester. So essentially, people are in the present and they choose for the future um, whether they can use laptops um, in class. Now, the utility is now different, and the key difference is that the laptop benefits are now in the future. Right? So the utility of using a laptop now, again, is, is zero in the present. So this is, again, we make choices for in the present for the future. But there's going to be no utility in the present. There's no lecture right now, no laptop benefits or the like. Um, and in the future, um, uh, everything is discounted by beta now because the person is present biased, potentially. So it's beta times L plus B minus D. The utility of not using a laptop is just zero. Again, like in the present, nothing happens. And then in the future, uh, the benefits as before are beta times CD. So the only thing, if you compare um, uh, this choice or this, this, these two options to the previous version, is the L now is discounted by beta, but, but before it was not. So let me just go back here. So here you see um, the L was like sort of, um, here you see the L is, um, not discounted by beta, this is when people make choices for the present. Instead, here now, the L is discounted by beta because that choice is uh, the, the, the laptop benefits are in the future. Now, we can do the same thing as before. Threshold for opting in is defined as like, or you can say this is essentially the indifference condition, so you can just equalize the two, um, the, 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 the utility of using the laptop or not using the laptop. And what you now get is that if L is larger than D or larger equals than D, um, then the person uses the laptop and other, uh, otherwise um, um, uh, they do not. Now, why does the threshold now change from beta D to, sorry, from beta times D to D? Well, because um, when laptop use can only happen uh, in the future, all benefits and costs are discounted at the same rate and that, that rate is beta. Question number three. Assume there's no um, laptop policy at all. Show that if beta times D smaller than uh, L and smaller than D, the student engages in preference reversals. She prefers, prefers not to use the laptop in future classes, but changes her mind when she's actually sitting on those future classes. That's sort of essentially the typical behavior of um, present biased people that when they're present bias, for at least some uh, parameter or constellations, uh, people engage in present bias. So let's do the math and see uh, what comes out here. So when thinking about future laptop use, the student, uh, student's problem is identical to the problem in part um, B, uh, sorry, in part two. Why is that? Well, because she discounts um, uh, uh, time of both one and two periods in advance by beta. Essentially, everything is in the future, so you just discounts everything by beta, that's exactly kind of the, the, the choice that we um, just had. So when thinking about future classes, when thinking about opting in into the laptop section, uh, the person makes a choice for the future. So here, um, uh, uh, which thinks about any future choices, um, uh, what really matters is essentially uh, the, 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 the value of the laptop is in the future, and we back in like part two that we just saw. 
Um, uh, now, uh, we know from part two that if, that if L equals uh, smaller than D, then she would like to not use the laptop, right? So we just uh, uh, solve for that in, in part number two. Um, but from part number one, we know that beta, if beta D is smaller than L, she will end up uh, using the laptop when she's actually sitting in the future class. That is to say, if she has a choice in any given class and come, shows up in class, she will say, oh, like using a laptop would be great. Same would be true with phones, by the way. Um, uh, and uh, when she has a choice in any given class that happens right now, if beta D equals smaller than uh, uh, L, she will end up using the laptop in class. So that implies essentially like a preference reversal um, uh, uh, using these parameter um, uh, assumptions. She prefers not to use the laptop in future classes, but switches her mind or changes her mind when she's actually sitting in those future um, classes. Okay, question number um, four. Explain why the fraction one minus beta d of the class uses a laptop in part one but fraction one minus D of the class uses the laptop in part D, uh, part two. Why does a smaller share of the class use their laptop in part two? All right. So now we're just essentially comparing part one and part two, and yeah, I'm gonna look at like what fraction of people are actually um, using um, the laptop. So we can sort of do the math version and think about like why that answer makes sense. So in part one, a student uses the laptop if L equals larger, uh, is larger than beta, beta times D. If F is the CDF of, 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 of um, L um, and, and, and sort of, and then, so there's a period missing, but sort of define F uh, uh, as the CDF of L, and then given the uniform um, uh, distribution, uh, the probability of, um, L being larger than beta D is one minus the, 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 the CDF, one minus F of beta delta, which is since it's uniform, it's just one minus um, beta D. Now, likewise, in part two, a student uses a laptop if L is larger than D. So we have um, the probability of L being larger than D is one minus um, the CDF of F of D, which is one minus um, D. So a smaller share uses the laptop in part two because the benefit of using a laptop is delayed and hence discounted by um, beta. So, you know, why is that? Well, essentially, um, think about it like this. If somebody has beta equals um, uh, one, which is kind of equivalent to like part two where people make choices for the future, if you use a laptop, so a share of people will like the laptop because, or you would like to use the laptop when making choices for the future, not because of self-control problems or the like, but just because they find laptops really helpful in taking notes. Now, if then a person in addition is present bias and makes a choice for the present, that enhances the short run um, um, uh, benefits because now the L is not discounted by beta anymore. Now it's essentially, it's, um, uh, 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 it's given sort of the, the, the benefit, it's, it's in the present and everything else beta is in the future. And so that means essentially that when make, making choices for the um, present, the present benefits, the L gets more weight um, relative to everything else, which is uh, gets the weight of beta less than one. And so now if you are ready and when making choices for the future, um, choose a laptop anyway, that implies that um, you also cho choose the laptop for the present. Essentially anybody who chooses a laptop for the future will also choose a laptop for the present and now there are some people essentially who don't have like huge variation. They might not choose the laptop for the future, but they might choose it. Uh, they will choose it for the present because of their present bias. And therefore, then the fraction of people who choose for the present will be larger than the fraction of people uh, who choose for the future, which we just showed um, using some algebra. Okay. Then finally, why would the social planner prefer the opt-in policy to both the policy of allowing students to choose whether to use their laptops and to banning laptops altogether? All right, so let's think about so this, the opt-in policy. Um, what, what does that really um, um, entail? Well, the opt-in policy, as we said, is the, present, the, the, the planner is not present bias. So the planner would only want uh, uh, students with L being larger than D to use laptops. And so the opt-in policy, as we just showed above, achieves this. So that's great. 
and they're like a free choice policy instead. Students with beta um, uh, times D, smaller than L, smaller than D, will suboptimally use their laptops, and the social planner does not like this. On the other hand, banning laptops altogether is suboptimal because welfare is gained by allowing the students with the highest valuations, with, with L equals, uh, sorry, L uh, larger than D, to use laptops, right? So banning laptops is not great because essentially there's some people who really would love to use their laptops regardless of present bias. And um, not allowing that is not great. Free choice is not great because essentially once you let people choose any given day, temptation will sort of kick in and some people will suboptimally use their laptops and just surf on the internet all day uh, or all class and not learn very much. And instead, so the policy where people opt in for the future um, essentially uh, achieves sort of the, the, the objective of the, um, the social planner who wants only students with L larger than D to use their laptops, um, and, and so the, the social planner will be happy and therefore prefer that policy over both free choice and over banning um, laptops. Okay, so that's the end. That's all I had to say um, about getting ready for the exam. Again, I think uh, you should prepare well, try to look at um, the materials. Um, please ask any questions in case things are unclear. Um, again, I have office hours on um, um, Friday, um, uh, April, um, April 3rd um, uh, at 4.30 to 6. I emailed you about that. Pierre-Luc also has office hours from 1.30 to 3.30. Um, again, that's in my email. Um, if you have questions, um, uh, please let us know, in particular on Piazza uh, or during office hours. But in any case, please do not worry too much about the exam. Try your best and you will be great. Um, but you know, even if you don't do great, you'll be fine. Uh, you will pass this class as long as you take the uh, exam and write something that uh, is remotely um, reasonable. Uh, thank you so much and uh, I look forward to seeing you in class soon.